Hi everybody and welcome to Mark Overanalyzes Film. Today I'll be celebrating the 40th anniversary of the release of 1982's Blade Runner by overanalyzing 2007's Blade Runner The Final Cut. Blade Runner was directed by Ridley Scott and written by Hampton Fancher and David Webb Peoples based on the novel Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep by Philip K. Dick. Now there's a lot to say even here at the outset. First of all, I am not overanalyzing the original Blade Runner as it just doesn't seem like anyone's idea of the best version of the film. More importantly, it doesn't seem to have been what people, I don't know, intended it to be. So I've decided to plump for the final cut as at least it's Scott's definitive version. The other thing I'd like to say is that Blade Runner is freaking weird and may not actually make any sense. And I'm really going to enjoy trying to figure out what I can and trying to figure out what I can't figure out and trying to figure out why I might still be okay with not being able to figure some things out. So with all that in mind, first I'll look at the fundamental features of the protagonist and then I'll go through the main story beats by looking at the sequences of the film. Then I'll talk about the main things I learned along the way. Okay, so without further ado, let's get into the five questions about the protagonist. Question one, whose story is it? And I'm already in trouble. On the one hand, there are plenty of reasons why you could argue that the real protagonist here is Roy Batty, but I'm going to go with the straightforward answer for reasons I'll get into and say the protagonist here is Harrison Ford's Rick Deckard. Deckard is a classic film noir detective. He's a jaded man in a jaded world. He's recently quit his job of hunting replicants but he's about to get that old job back, pretty much at gunpoint. Question two, what is his life dream? Life dream here refers to what it is that the protagonist wants or is aiming to do when the film begins and the story has yet to properly start. Deckard is an interesting protagonist in a lot of ways. In some ways he's an interesting character because there's not that much character there. Or, you know, at least... There's not much we're overtly told, perhaps. When we meet Deckard, he's waiting for food. No sooner has he sat down than he's summoned to his mission. And yet, there's something odd about Deckard even here. He's reading the paper. He looks around him and contemplates the world around him. He is the only person who is not either wearing a hat or carrying an umbrella or both. He uses his paper to cover his head. He doesn't speak the language that everyone around him speaks. He's an outsider, and this outsiderness really defines him. He's soon to be dragged back in, very much against his will. So there's any number of ways you could describe this. Deckard wants to be far away, or he wants to be removed, or he wants to be free. But at this point at least, there seems to be limitations on any of those things that he's looking for. Question three, what is his want? Want here is what the character is trying to achieve in act two of the film from the moment they really begin their journey until the moment they are at their most defeated. As such, it is a smart goal in that it is specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time bound. Now, this is, as all things are with Blade Runner, a matter of opinion. But I find it hard to get away from the conclusion that the want that defines the film's second act and ultimately shapes Blade Runner is not Deckard's. It's Roy Batty's. 25 minutes into our film, Roy turns up and tells himself and the audience that he has time enough. Almost exactly one hour later, he takes his mission as far as it can go. So what is Roy's want? More life. So the central question of Act 2 is, will Roy succeed in getting more life? Or will Roy succeed in avoiding death? Question 4. What is his need? Need is the human quality or piece of wisdom that the character lacks at the beginning of the story. Oh boy, these questions aren't getting any easier, are they? So considering how little we know about Deckard and considering how elusive and enigmatic so much of Blade Runner is, this is tricky enough to really get at. Let's focus on how Deckard is different at the end of the film from how he is at the start of the film. 
There are two things that strike me. First, at the beginning, Deckard is alone, removed from those around him. Second, he's still here. Now, there's any number of reasons why that might be, and I imagine the first is financial. But when he sees someone embrace death before his eyes and talk about what it means to really die, what is lost when life is ended, Deckard goes from a person who kills for money to a person who will go on the run with a fugitive to protect her. No conversation about Blade Runner doesn't end up with some version of the question, what does it mean to be human? But for now, let me say that Deckard needs to stop surviving and actually live. Question 5. Does he get what he wants and or what he needs? Again, Blade Runner is slightly unusual in that there's this want-need split between characters. But what isn't unusual is the relationship between these two things. So many films end with the protagonist learning the important life lesson by failing to get what it is that they've been chasing after. And here, Roy's want ends in failure, spectacularly weird failure, and that leads to Deckard getting what he needs by learning from this failure. As Mary Kate O'Flanagan points out, you'll often find the theme of the film between the want and the need. If Blade Runner is about what it means to be human, then this is our answer. We are emotional creatures, formed by experience and memory, designed to empathize with each other, and predestined to die before too long. In a busy, tiring, complicated, often cruel world, it's easy to forget all that. But, to paraphrase Frank Costello in The Departed, Blade Runner tells us we're all on our way out, so we should act accordingly. Now that I've attempted to answer the five key questions, let's have a look at Blade Runner's sequences. There is normally, but not always, eight sequences or stages in a film. A sequence is a combination of scenes that are tied together by having a single overriding dramatic question or tension, and they tend to be between 10 and 15 minutes in length. A good way to think about it is that every 10 to 15 minutes, the audience is generally on some level asking themselves a different dramatic question. Act 1 contains the first two sequences, and the first one is basically life as it is. Now, a film always has to introduce its world and the rules therein, even if it's set on, you know, Main Street Roscommon. But it is especially important to set up a world like Blade Runner. And so we begin with a scrawl to tell us just what a replicant is and just what a Blade Runner is. And also that we're in 2019 LA. And then, bam, one of the most famous opening shots in cinema history, a massive, nightmarishly industrial mega cityscape. Let me tell you, this ain't Main Street Roscommon. There are flying cars and gigantic dominating pyramidic structures. There's also an eye watching it all. Now, even by my standards, this is a little bit early for a tangent, but well, it's Blade Runner, so let's get weird. Scott uses an editing technique often, especially in this first act, that's quite interesting to me. Now, it's quite a basic editing technique, but it's very noticeable here. The famous Russian filmmaker Lev Kuleshov discovered that if you place two images beside each other, the audience will automatically make a link between the two. This is where the whole idea of montage comes from. In the original example, he showed a man looking rather intently, but, you know, somewhat blankly. If the next shot was of a bowl of soup, Audiences assumed the man was hungry. If it was a coffin, they thought he was grieving. If it was a woman lying on a couch, they assumed he was, you know, consumed with love. The face was the exact same, only our interpretations of it changed, depending on what it was paired with. You know, this was some kind of test, and it showed, depending on your interpretation, the limits of, or the incredible capacity of, human empathy. So it feels like no fluke that the director here is using it so blatantly in Blade Runner. So the first use is this opening montage, an eye beholding this city just as we are. There's not much to say that this eye couldn't be bored, but who has ever thought that as they begin this film? And then we begin properly with an empathy test. 
which the test giver would clearly fail on grounds that he's clearly a jackass. But he'll never get that chance because he's testing a replicant, Leon, who shoots him. And it's worth noting that Leon almost certainly does this because Leon can't get his head around why a human might turn a tortoise over in the desert and watch it bake. He realizes he'll fail this test, and so he acts. And the fact that this Blade Runner is murdered is our inciting incident, the event without which our story as it is would not occur. But with this guy dead, the cops now need a new Blade Runner, or indeed, an old one. And so at that, we meet our man Deckard. And again, notice how out of place he seems here. Everyone else is busy, everyone else is going somewhere, everyone else is prepared for the rain. Not Deckard. He also doesn't seem to speak the lingo. But when we have a hero who doesn't want to get involved, the story doesn't tend to spend too long getting on with involving them. At the start of Dirty Harry, Callahan only gets one bite of his hot dog before being called into action, and here Deckard is going to have to have his noodles in a police car. Deckard is summoned to meet Bryant, who commands Deckard to use his old blade running magic to take out four skin jobs loose in the city. Deckard is then shown info on the replicants in question, which poses a problem story-wise. The cops have photos and details of these replicants. Why did they need to use the Voigt-Kampf test on Leon at all? This is just one potential plot hole that I'd like to get back to at the end. More importantly though, and almost certainly not coincidentally, we're quickly thrown out of this scene with our next sequence tension. Will the Voigt-Kampf test work on the Nexus 6 over at the Tyrell Corporation. So Deckard heads over to the Tyrell Corporation to test Tyrell's beautiful assistant Rachel, but again notice here that we have our second major Kuleshov effect sequence. As they approach the Tyrell buildings, we keep cutting to Deckard's face. He could be thinking anything, he could be scared, he could be bored, he could be wishing he had more noodles. And also notice that this second Kuleshov sequence once again comes in the scene right before another empathy test. It might be a coincidence, it might not be, I'm not sure. And interestingly, Deckard's enigmatic appearance here foreshadows Rachel's. Tyrell asks Deckard to test the Voigt-Kampf machine on her, suggesting that she's human in the process. Deckard eventually figures out that she's a replicant, but it takes far longer than normal. And then we have the real rub here. Rachel really thinks she's human because she's been given memories. You could be a replicant and never even realize. Rachel is an experiment, nothing more. We began to recognize in them strange obsession. After all, they are emotionally inexperienced with only a few years in which to store up the experiences which you and I take for granted. If we gift them with the past, we create a cushion or pillow for their emotions, and consequently we can control them better. Memories. You're talking about memories. So, replicants have come to Earth. Deckard has to find them and kill them. He's met Rachel, a beautiful replicant who does not actually know she's a replicant. And this gives Deckard pause. Our pieces are all in place. So it's time to end Act 1 and begin Act 2. Act 2 begins with Sequence 3, the first attempts to solve the problem. Now we're first going to see Deckard's initial attempts to track the replicants, where he goes to Leon's apartment and finds the snake scale and the photos, but we're soon joining Roy Batty, who decides after investigating his hand that he has time enough. To my mind, this immediately raises the question, time enough for what? And we will see that this sequence is really dominated by his first attempts to get what he wants longevity. He and Leon do the shoe leathering that you'd really think Deckard should be doing. They go to someone low down on the chain in replicant production, Chew, intimidate him, and discover that they'll need to talk to Tyrell. And in order to do that, they'll have to use J.F. Sebastian. Now, Act 2 normally starts with a what's the plan scene, and this is a classic of the genre. We now know what the replicants are after, and we know roughly the steps they're going to have to take to get there. And we've discovered that their first attempts are insufficient, so we should move on to sequence 4, the greater attempts to solve the problem. But 
before we do that, there is one more thing here to address. Sequence 3 normally ends with the character's first unconscious move towards their need. At the end of Act 1, Deckard asked about Rachel, how can it not know what it is? Ten minutes later, when he comes home exhausted, he's alarmed to discover this replicant is waiting for him. But then something changes. Realizing that she's been rejected by Tyrell, who just seems like a real class act, he takes pity on her and invites her in. He rather cruelly proves she's a replicant, importantly by revealing that he knows her dreams and memories, and then he tries to walk it back when he sees that she's really upset. Implants. Those aren't your memories, they're somebody else's. They're Tyrell's nieces. Okay. Bad joke. I made a bad joke. You're not a replicant. Go home. Okay? No, really. I'm sorry. He offers to get her a drink, but she walks out. He considers the childhood photos she's left behind, which prompts him to look at the photos he found in Leon's apartment. These photos are soon to bring him to his next lead. So Deckard has begun to empathize with a replicant, making a first move towards his need, and as a reward, he's going to receive a new lead. But first we have a kind of mini-sequence as we meet Pris and we wonder, will Pris get in with JF? I hate all of this stuff with JF, it just seems so cruel. Pris pretends to be homeless and after some flirting, JF invites her up. As soon as she's in, she's pretty upfront about the fact that she has a friend, and she'll be inviting them over tomorrow. And that's JF told, and that's pretty much JF doomed. But at that we move to the main tension of a longer sequence. We rejoin Deckard, almost collapsed over a piano, and again we have something of a Kuleshov effect here. His eyes open, and then slightly widen, as he daydreams of a unicorn running through a wood. This is about to prompt him to pick up Leon's photos and start analysing them. But why? It's certainly enigmatic to me. When you watch this sequence, what do you think is going through Deckard's head? What is Harrison Ford implying? And what are we inferring? Is there a gap or a difference between those two things? Why is he dreaming of a unicorn? And why would that dream of a unicorn prompt him to start looking at the photos. It's hard to say with any great certainty, but we can make a few guesses. Now, I've looked up quite a bit of analysis of Blade Runner, and you get all kinds of interpretations of all sorts of things, nothing more so than the unicorn. I've seen it interpreted as life eternal, and I've seen it interpreted as Rachel, but it's hard to deny that a unicorn running through a wood feels evocative of freedom. Again, Recall that Deckard has just made his first unconscious move towards his need in meeting and empathizing with Rachel. When we first met Deckard, he was ostensibly free, or at least that's the term I like to use for being unemployed. But again, Deckard was just hanging out because he had nowhere really to go. Having met Rachel and dreaming now of real freedom, it could be argued that he's spurred to get this job done. And so we wonder some version of the question, Will this clue lead Deckard to one of the replicants? He investigates the photo using future magic, and he soon discovers a woman. The man is finally doing some goddamn detecting, and he gets to a bar where the lady might be. Then, strangely, he decides to call Rachel and invite her down here. But once Rachel turns his offer down, he's back on the case, and he does some classic undercovering to get into Zora's, the replicant's, changing room. There, Zora 80s up her hair, clips on her only front half Princess Leia bra, puts on her see-through raincoat, and now that she's good to go, she makes a run for it. There's a chase, and Deckard eventually tracks her down and shoots her. So, will that clue lead Deckard to one of the replicants? Yes. And he's retired her. So, our sequence tension is answered. Now, we are right here at the midpoint of the film, and at the midpoint we have the protagonist's first conscious 
move towards their need. And it definitely feels that here, though exactly what you want to classify it as is debatable. Deckard kills Zora, which is the first big step on his mission, but he sure seems shaken by it. He really seems shaken by death now. Bryant appears to take pleasure from highlighting just what a killer Deckard is, but that's not the impression we get. At the start of the film, Deckard is given no choice but to kill these replicants. At the end of the film, he goes on the run to protect one. And it's here at the midpoint where he's smack bang between these two points. He's killed Zora, but he insists to Bryant that there's three, not four replicants left. He will not kill Rachel. And having made a real move towards his need, as is so often the case, the protagonist is rewarded. Leon has been watching from the shadows and attacks Deckard, who is surely a dead man until Rachel appears and shoots his assailant. And at that, we enter the honeymoon sequence proper, where the protagonist acts in accordance with their need. And so Deckard brings Rachel home, and there is quite a lot to talk about here, including some stuff that I'd really rather not talk about, but I have to at least touch on, I think. First, Deckard promises that he wouldn't chase after Rachel if she disappeared. Then, notably after his bluntness earlier, he dodges the question of whether he knows when she'll die or not. This shows that Deckard is changing, or learning at least, which is really important for our story shape. Thirdly, and most central to the core of the film, Rachel asks Deckard if he's taken the Voigtkampf test himself. The insect date. The longevity, those things. You saw them? They're classified. But you're a policeman. I didn't look at them. You know that void comp test of yours? Did you ever take that test yourself? Now, he doesn't answer because he drifts off to sleep for a few moments, but you might notice here how the camera is completely different for the moment when Rachel asks the question. Remember this for later. The camera does move in Blade Runner, but it's normally quite stable. The first moment where it's really clearly handheld and unstable, mirroring a sense of kind of destabilization in our story, is when Rachel asks this question. And it's really noticeable because it stays on her for a long time. The final thing to quickly mention is that they play music together. And music and art in general almost always pops up in stories about what makes us human. A great example of this is Kazuo Ishiguro's novel Never Let Me Go. But then something else happens. Some heavy eye contact and flirtation precedes Deckard leaning in to kiss Rachel. She gets up to leave, he rushes after her, and he holds the front door closed as she tries to exit. He then pushes her back and starts giving her instructions, like telling her to tell him to kiss her. Now, you might regard this as, I don't know, provocative, and you might regard this as something far worse and completely unacceptable. Honestly, however you feel about it, you could probably convince me in the moment. To discuss this in any meaningful way would take a long time and it's not really what I'm here for and I'm certainly no expert. So let me just say this. As far as I'm concerned, I think the film Blade Runner considers this merely provocative, for whatever that's worth, and that Rachel really does want to do these things in the film and that Deckard really knows that. But... Having said that, I still find it quite an uncomfortable watch in the film, and despite significant differences, I also find it a quite uncomfortable read in the script as well. But for the moment, I think I'm just going to have to leave it at that. And at that, we leave our honeymoon period and enter sequence 6, the bridge from the honeymoon period to the low point. Now, as I said earlier, I think Act 2 is really defined by Roy's want. And that's pretty clear here, as this sequence is clearly Roy's. And Deckard does not actually feature at all for the next 15 minutes, or until we begin Act 3. One quick note on this, this is different from the Hampton Fancher script you can find online, that spends 
far too much time hanging out with Deckard, having the best sex of his life for days on end with Rachel, and saying stuff like, good for a smart girl to feel stupid, part of your education? Ugh, I think I just threw up in my own mouth a little. Anyways, the point is that Deckard is unusually passive for so much of this film. And so it's really no harm to leave him behind here for a while until we need him again. While Deckard is otherwise, and perhaps questionably, occupied, Pris and Roy are manipulating and physically coercing a lonely, sick young man. We really are approaching a low point. It's worth noting here though that this is where we really get to see how childlike, odd, and emotionally erratic the replicants are. Rutger Hauer's Roy behaves like a sad little boy all of a sudden when he has to tell Pris that Leon is dead, but then quickly snaps back to kind of a confident self-assurance in the next line. But they've soon convinced JF to bring Roy to meet his maker, and there we have the real crux of all of Blade Runner. Roy confronts Tyrell and demands to be given more life. Tyrell kind of fobs off his concerns, far more interested in the replicant as an expression of his own ingenuity rather than the tortured soul before him. And to that point, when Roy learns there's nothing to be done for him, he doesn't immediately kill Tyrell, you might notice. He seems to express contrition for his actions, as if looking for forgiveness. And Tyrell expresses zero moral considerations. Look at you. You're the prodigal son. You're quite a prize. I've done questionable things. Also extraordinary things. Revel in your time. Nothing the god of biomechanics wouldn't let you in heaven. And, well, if the creator is amoral, then the universe is amoral. So what the hell, let's get freaky and kill God. And it must be pointed out that Roy kisses and crushes God, Tyrell, at the same time. A mixture of love and hate. It's interesting to wonder what would have been different, if anything, had Tyrell expressed some, any kind of paternal moral judgment but he didn't and Roy kills him and JF and it still bothers me why he killed JF JF helped Roy and the cops went straight to the apartment anyways nothing was gained but well we live in an amoral universe apparently and you've just killed God so I guess nothing really matters anyways Roy Batty's want of getting more life has definitively failed and so our central tension of Act 2 has been definitively answered. Deckard is soon to hear of this murder and have a final confrontation with these replicants who don't have long to live anyways. And so we end Act 2, and we move in to Act 3. Act 3 has a false resolution and a true resolution, and it's interesting to think of Blade Runner's Act 3 in this way, because normally you have the hero at their most defeated before they finally win, here, Deckard is pretty much roughed up and out of his depth throughout, but he's able to beat and kill Pris, and then is completely beaten and defeated by Roy. Alternatively, you could say the first half of the act is Deckard as Hunter, and the second is Deckard as Prey, which is quite interesting. Either way, he finds and kills Pris before Roy arrives and hunts him for sport. Deckard doesn't really stand a chance and makes a desperate and seemingly ill-fated run for it, Again, just tons of Rutger Hauer's Roy Batty being absolutely bizarre here. The way he kisses Pris is strange, the howling, the counting, the putting his head through a wall for shits and giggles, and then clinging on pretty tightly to a dove. One thing is undeniable though, he is alive and really in the moment. With all the rain in this film, he's the only one to dip his head out into it, to feel the sensation of it. Maybe it's because he is, at least on some level, kind of a child, or perhaps it's because he knows he's about to die. And on that note, he starts to seize up during this chase, and to keep himself going for just a little bit longer, he sticks a nail through his hand, which is a clear stigmatic Christ reference. But 
Eventually, the chase is more or less ended. Deckard is unable to outrun the superior Roy for long, and he ends up hanging on to a beam for dear life. But he can't do it. His hand slips. And then Roy, who has just been chasing this man that killed two of his friends, grabs him and pulls him back up. And he then provides probably the most famous moment of this film, and one of the most famous moments in the last 40 years of cinema. A contemplation on what it means to die. I watched sea beams glitter in the dark near the ten hours of gate. All those moments will be lost in time. Like tears in rain. And then he does just that. One of the great things about Blade Runner, I think, is that it never once actually mentions the word soul. But when Batty dies, the dove he's been grasping onto for dear life soars towards the heavens, which immediately puts the idea in our heads. Now, there's a lot to unpack here, of course, but leaving aside these significant thematic concerns for a moment, there's a practical question of why Roy would save Deckard. Many suggest that it is essentially so that Roy can give his death speech, and that may well be true. I'll get into this more later, but I'm inclined to think that Roy is a child, and in this case, something of a dog chasing a car. Deckard is there to be chased. And Roy clearly acts as if it was a game throughout. Once he has Deckard, the game is over. He might as well save him. Also, social psychologists sometimes describe people as being relentlessly social. I find that this is never more true than in children also. Just about everyone in Blade Runner is characterized at some stage by how alone, removed, or aloof they are. Ivory towers are impressive, but Tyrell has an ivory pyramid. I'm inclined to think Roy just didn't want to be alone. Now, there's many that say that he becomes something of a holy figure here at the end and, you know, cherishes life. But I'm not that sold on that idea overall, as it's just not really been long enough since he slaughtered JF. And JF had it coming a lot less than Deckard does. Anyways, Deckard sits, watching this death, trying to take in what it all means. And then Gaff turns up and tells him, suspiciously somewhat, that he's done a man's job. And then, enigmatically, it's too bad she won't live, but then again, who does? All this time, Deckard has been surviving in a world as jaded as he is. But now he's met someone that he really cares about. And he's seen death and what it means right up close. If the memories we have define our time on this earth, who we are, and what makes us human, then you'd better stop lounging around at home drinking whiskey, hitting your job, and merely surviving your life. Going about things that way, when your time comes, there won't be many tears to shed. And so Deckard rushes home to check if Rachel is still okay. She's still there, and so is her love, her trust, and her empathy. So they rush out the door, about to go on the run. Now, two quick points here. One, I like how Deckard has a cardigan version of his trench coat. I would really like that. Two, remember how I said how the camera was unusually unstable when Rachel implied that Deckard could be a replicant in the honeymoon sequence? Well, here in this hallway scene, the camera is once again very unusually unstable. This is a clear stylistic callback to Rachel's question which absolutely reinforces the implication and the impact of this final moment. As Rachel runs to the elevator, she hits something on the ground. Deckard picks it up. It's another of Gaff's origami pieces, a unicorn, just like Deckard had dreamed of. Now, as far as I'm concerned, this is incontrovertible evidence that Deckard is a replicant, but many would disagree. So. We're left with the question, is Deckard a replicant? Will Gaff hunt him and Rachel down? And even if Gaff doesn't, do they have long to live? There's only one thing that we know for sure. It will all end 
in tears. There are two related things that I would like to discuss in particular about Blade Runner. The first is dealing with that final question we're left with. Is Deckard a replicant? Now, I'll consider the evidence, but I'm less interested in the question itself, to be honest, than I am with how the film poses it and the problems it presents in doing so. To begin at the end, it's hard to see how, in the later cuts of the film at least, Deckard is not a replicant. Once you have the scene where Deckard tells Rachel about the dreams that she has had, the daydream of the unicorn, and the final origami unicorn scene, there's just no way around it that I can see. Any other interpretation of the origami unicorn is just far too reliant on coincidence. And films should never rely on coincidence, especially right at the end. So why is this even a question then? Well, there's a couple of reasons. A. Ridley Scott says that Deckard is a replicant and Harrison Ford and the screenwriters say that he wasn't in their minds. And B. This discrepancy between the creative forces is all over the film. Now you could call this complexity or nuance, but another, to my mind more accurate term, is riddled with fucking plot holes. To decide whether or not Deckard is a replicant is not really to interpret the entirety of the film, but to decide which parts of the film to overlook. We are told right at the start that it is illegal for replicants to be on Earth, so why would the cops be using one? And while Gaff treats Deckard like dirt throughout, Bryant seems to treat him pretty much as a human, despite being pretty derogatory about replicants. The one potential exception is when Deckard asks Bryant about the Voigtkampf test not working on Nexus 6s. Bryant certainly seems to consider something unpleasant here, but that's probably more to do with the question than who it's coming from. And the fact that Harrison Ford has said he played Deckard as human is certainly no small potatoes. Now one could argue that the director convincing the actor that he's being a human while he's actually being a robot is all the more expressive of the idea that this is a replicant who thinks it's human. But performance-wise, Deckard acts nothing like the other replicants. The Nexus 6 escapees are all childlike and wild, as Tyrell suggests they are still in early emotional development. Rachel, by contrast, is extremely controlled and is clearly meant to be ever so slightly robotic in her movements and demeanor. Furthermore, she is meant to be an experiment, implying that she, and therefore this technology and method, is new. So Deckard would also have to be new, and probably some kind of prototype. But he has none of the mannerisms of Rachel or any of the others. And then of course there are the thematic elements which this undercuts. Thematically, this story is arguably richer throughout if Deckard is human. Now that might sound surprising as what would be richer than our audience avatar being a replicant all this time and us not even realizing it. Maybe we could be replicants if the Avatar could be. But, as the screenwriter Hampton Fancher pointed out, if Deckard is a replicant, then the climax is not a fight of man versus machine, but two machines. Similarly, the question of a human and a replicant falling in love is undercut if both are replicants. Maybe they're just producing the same ersatz version of the emotion. If one isn't definitely real, it makes the exploration of emotion a lot less interesting. And all of this is oddly indicative of the wider issue of story issues or plot holes throughout. The cops have photos of the replicants, even if the photos only arrived after Leon shot the Blade Runner in our first scene, why did Deckard need to analyze Leon's photos before checking out the snake scale? Was the snake face tattoo that important? And why does Roy know Deckard's name in the final sequence and that he didn't kill Leon? As I was doing the research for this, I came across a lot of such questions and not a lot of very satisfying answers. Some stuff got cut out that explains other parts a little bit, but then other stuff got cut out that would contradict other parts of the film. So I don't really accept that as anything really acceptable as a reason. For example, for this question of why Roy saves Deckard's life, apparently Ridley Scott said he initially catches him out of kind of a reflexive instinct, but after that, he really doesn't know. Now, 
This feels unsatisfying, especially for a film that seems as loaded with meaning as Blade Runner. So at that, let me get on to my second connected point. And that is, I love Blade Runner. There are plot holes galore and it just doesn't bother me that much. And I'm not totally sure why that is, but I have some ideas. First of all, my old college lecturer and fellow podcaster Stephen Benedict always used to tell us that what makes a film is not really the traditional idea of structure, but tone, texture, and tempo. Now unsurprisingly, I don't really agree on that structure point, but it's hard to deny that what makes Blade Runner Blade Runner completely aligns with Steven's breakdown. The way Blade Runner feels, the way it looks and sounds, and the way it moves is what makes it truly stand out. You could make an argument that the film Dark City gets its similar themes as well as Blade Runner does, but it doesn't look or sound or feel this good. The clothes, the sets, the gun, the lighting, the Vangelis score, it's so incredibly evocative. But I want to point out something else here. I didn't like Blade Runner 2049 at all, and it was because of story issues and plot holes, my brain was constantly thrashing throughout thinking, that makes no sense, or why would he do that? Blade Runner 2049 also looks and sounds incredible. So why am I not okay with it in that, but I am okay with this stuff in Blade Runner? So there are two reasons, I think. First of all, there is the issue of pacing, and my number one pet gripe with all modern films is running time. Blade Runner The Final Cut is an hour and 52 minutes long. Blade Runner 2049 is 2 hours and 43 minutes long. Both Blade Runners are mood pieces. But if you're relying on mood and if you're trying to glide over plot holes, keep the story moving and keep your film under 2 hours. It's just common sense. Now, also, in his great book, Story, Robert McKee discusses the occasional unavoidability of plot holes. Therein, he gives the examples of Terminator, Casablanca, and Chinatown, which he rather convincingly argues all contain major plot holes. And those films are, you know, pretty good. But the thing is, the holes here don't really bother us. Now, he states that one reason for this is that the films drive at these plot holes. They deal with them. Sarah Connor admits that she can't explain how Terminator's time travel could possibly make sense. And in Casablanca, the character Ferrari expresses surprise at his own surprising actions. Now, perhaps a more important reason he also points out is narrative drive. In most good films with plot holes, we're past the plot holes by the time we have time to recognize them for what they are. Terminator is again a great example of this. There's so much propulsion to the story and so many immediate problems to deal with. The logic gap at the base of everything doesn't really need addressing until later. And there's plenty of this narrative drive going on in Blade Runner. But the most important, I think, is a third point. That the characters behave congruously on a scene-by-scene basis. It might not make much sense that the cops have photos of the replicants, and yet Deckard later goes looking for a visual, but time has passed and Deckard is acting in concert with what we feel he should be doing as a detective. Similarly, by the end of the film, when we discover that Deckard is almost certainly a replicant, we haven't seen Bryant for the better part of an hour. And when Bryant was interacting with Deckard, the emotionality and psychology of that scene made sense with the knowledge that we had at that time. Now, I've only seen Blade Runner 2049 once in the cinema, so forgive me if I'm misremembering details, but I remember thinking we were in trouble in the very first scene. There's a gigantic hulking mass of a man, Sapper Morton, and he's visited by main character K. K sits down, puts his gun down, and slowly takes his gloves off. And I already wanted to scream, for the love of God, man, he's right there. It is completely unnatural for you to put your gun down and put something in the way of your hand's mobility. It's the kind of plot hole that your brain, or my brain at least, cannot get over. It's clear as day they just decided it seemed like a cool moment and they didn't care that it ruined the sense of the scene. Now I think there are more significant plotting and structural issues in Blade Runner 2049 across the board. 
but it's all really brought home when characters do stuff like this. Especially any time Jared fucking Leto's Neander Wallace turns up. Nothing that character does makes any logical or emotional sense. And that's really what it comes down to. Character. So why doesn't Ridley Scott know why Roy saves Deckard's life? I think he does know. I think he just can't express it. Roy is acting on instinct, and so is Ridley Scott. Now, I just so happen to think Ridley Scott's emotional and storytelling instincts are better than Denis Villeneuve's, or perhaps that he just maybe pays a little bit more attention to them than Villeneuve might at times. Ultimately, I could break down the differences in the nature of all the plot holes between Blade Runner and its sequel, but really and truly, I just want to tell you that Blade Runner feels right. Despite these plot holes, it feels like the character motivations and emotions are truthful at any given moment. The enigmatic nature of the film is also deployed well and consistently to allow us to debate what is implied and what is inferred without us feeling necessarily like the film is artificially holding information back to maintain a mystery that it itself does not know the answer to. And so, all the big questions. Why does Roy save Deckard? What makes Blade Runner work? What makes us human? All fundamentally have the same answer. Emotionally, we feel it to be truthful. But strictly speaking, we can't explain it. Put simply, we really don't know. This has been Mark Gives Up Over Analyzing Blade Runner. The next episode is the 10th in the series and will be releasing on July 4th, so it's time to celebrate the American blockbuster. Sometimes a film asks us what it means to be human, and sometimes it just tells us to close the goddamn beaches. It's time to overanalyze Steven Spielberg's Jaws. If you enjoyed this episode, please like, rate, follow, recommend, and whatever else it is that's good for this kind of thing. A special thanks to Mary Kate O'Flanagan, who taught me everything I know about film, including these methods. Thanks for listening. Take care of yourselves and see you soon.